before I forget, um, in addition to, I don't, I don't want to forget to mention, it's very, very important, that in addition to being the ASAP prize winner, Passam in Shadow Letters is also the winner of our very important Clio Visualizing History Prize for the Advancement of Women in Film. The subtext, yes, feel free to applaud. The subtext of this prize is that it is awarded to a woman filmmaker who boldly and richly explores either a person or a phenomenon of historical significance. And I think from this film you can understand why it won this prize, because it brought to light somebody that I think many of us did not know about, but whose significance is extraordinary in the culture and the history and the going forward of Nepal. Um, the donor of this prize, Lola Van Wagen, has joined us, and if you could just stand for a second, Lola, and thank you for all you have done to make this prize so important. Lola Van Wagen. So, Nancy will be here on closing night, so we'll be giving her her v -teddy then, and if you'd like to come on closing night, we'll have, it's a very joyous time, and this film elevates the whole evening. Uh, so, I think maybe I might reflect others in saying, can you give us the origin story of this film? I know that you are married to Hassan's youngest brother, is that correct? My sister. Your sister is married to him. Okay. And was that your avenue into everything you were able to assemble here? Yes, absolutely. I, I do want to say, Lloyd, Wayne and Lola, I, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here uh, and honored. Um, well, we are happy to have you. Yeah. Nancy joined us from San Francisco yesterday, right? And got a good night's sleep so she could be the top of her head. <laughs> so yes, I, I learned about the story. My sister, Karen, um, who and married a Sherpa man, a lovely man, Andorji Sherpa, they live in the Bay Area as well, and, and they would have loved to have been here, but we're actually in another film festival at the, this weekend in California, and they elected to go and represent us there. Um, but Karen and Dorje got married, and, and I knew him, and it wasn't for, I don't know, maybe a couple of years, um, but we were, that I was at with them having dinner, and you know, over a, a nice bottle of wine, and we got to talking, and he, told me the story of his sister. And it was one of those, just one of those events in one's life, you know, sort of that aha moment where, where I was touched so deeply by the story. And, and I felt this kind of kinship in this bizarre, transcending time and space way to this extraordinary woman. And I just felt, you know, Dorji told me that he, you know, had so he wished he could have made a film about her. He went, you know, that he wanted wanted to have her story told because she's very famous in Nepal. You know, there's a life size statue of her which you saw. They they went kind of overboard to try to honor her after they charged her the outrageous fee and all of that. You know, and put her in a she has a postage stamp, hospital, school, road, all that named after her. But nobody has told her story outside of Nepal and. I decided that I wanted to tell her story, which was in and of itself sort of an audacious thing since I was having another career at the time. I was not a filmmaker. <laughs> she is now. <laughs> when did the work begin? So I, I, as I said, I was working. I was in corporate America. I uh, had a big job, traveled around, and I um, wasn't was had was had found myself extremely disconnected from what I was doing for quite some time and and you know my roots my childhood roots my roots through high school and college was always a creative whether that was music or drama or storytelling writing and and I really found my way back to who I am through this film and and decided you know to make it I mean of course the first thing I did because I knew how to organize and do, you know, 
management projects and all of that. And so I put together a foundation, uh, a 501c3, so I could raise my own money. And then I put together a creative board. So I went and found filmmakers, documentary filmmakers in the Bay Area who would mentor me and who, for whom, you know, who, who found the story really compelling and said that would be, that would be a, a, an amazing film. And then I just began to put one foot in front of the other and find team members, creative, amazing people. I mean, this is the thing with a story like this. You know, it, it, it attracts the people because it, it is so wanting to be told. And so I found an editor who said, yeah, I'll do that. I'll come on board with you. And then I found a writer, and then I found a producer, and I found a... And, and, and that's kind of the way the project went. Lots of, I mean, believe me, like, over 10 years in the making. So um, lots of trial and error. There were times when I, I could have finished, I guess, but I wasn't satisfied. And I, I felt so, it was so incredibly important. This is a piece of history that, you know, that needs to be recorded, um, that for Nepal and for all of those people outside of Nepal, for whom this is a, an incredibly contemporary story of somebody who pushed the boundaries of you know, where they were born and, and the life they were supposed to have. Well, I would say that the finished product um, is it's, all, it's right there. It's not, com not complicated. You're, you, we have point A and we have a, a point B finish. And we are able to follow this very closely as if you were going from base camp to camp one, to camp two. And in the end, it's extraordinarily satisfying because you have given us the story. Um, before she started climbing, you've given us that story. And in the wake of her death, you've given us the story of how she lives on, which is fantastic. Uh, what did you first think when you encountered all this footage? And what was the source of the footage? Because it's just so rich, so, com so complete in many ways. Well, I didn't just encounter it. <laughs> I looked for it under rocks and in closets. And, so was it was in um, many places? It was, a, yes, I gathered the footage from lots of places. I mean, it was truly like, I, I was a detective. I mean, and I was, you know, I would call people and say, hey, you know, I'm making this film. I heard that your brother was on Everest in 1990 or whatever. I mean, it literally happened like that. and and. And I would find, I'd get a lead, and then I would follow that lead. I mean, for instance, Marc Retard, the, the, French, the French gentleman, <laughs> um, I found him in Brazil. I mean, <laughs> we, I didn't go to Brazil. I actually flew him to, to San Francisco. But, but I mean, that's, I, I, I realized that first climb was a really pivotal, you know, pivotal piece of the story, that first climb in 1990 in France. And, and so I found him, I found you know, a neighbor who was a native French speaker, and I said, you know, I'm trying to reach this person, do you know anybody? And it was literally like that. It actually, the Pema Norbu, the, the guy, the Sherpa who was the last person to see her alive, um, I searched for him for years. I hired a private investigator. <laughs> to try to find him. I finally found, because no, he was like a ghost. Nobody could find him. He wasn't really in the fall anymore. I heard he would married an American woman. And we found her in a suburb of Portland. And I called her. And uh, she, when I told her who I was and what I was doing, and I was looking for Pemba, she said, oh, he won't talk to you. I mean, she, she, and she was not very friendly either. He said that, she, you know, that was a very painful time in his life and he doesn't talk about it anymore. And, and that was it. So on my last production trip to Nepal, my Nepali uh, producer, my um, um, production head, Siren Richard Sherpa, I, there were a couple people that I was really intent on finding and he found him. He happened to be there. And he happened to be leaving back for the States in like a couple days. And so Siren found him, um, gave him money. That's how we convinced him to stay. He actually changed his flight. And then we took him, along with the other gentleman, Juan Tile, who were on that climb, you know, that last climb. And um, come to behold, they had, had not seen each other since they brought his body down. And they didn't like each other. 
<laughs> and and actually, uh, um, Pemba quit climbing after that. He had post-traumatic stress from all the people that he'd known who died. He quit climbing and disappeared, and kind of do, is doing hydroelectric work now in rural Nepal. But we had to put them in separate SUVs to go out to this really remote uh, place where we did that shoot like because they really disliked each other. And, and so yeah, I mean, I literally, I, I looked for footage everywhere and there's people. Also, there's also a lot of archival work here too. And one of the tricks of the trade that Nancy quickly realized is find a way to to show what, what, you, what you don't have. And so we had archival producers worked hard, but a lot of people, you know, um, I didn't realize this, that uh, the village that uh, Asamalama grew up in, there were no cameras. So there's no, there's no archival, there's no footage of her as a child at all, there's nothing. You know, so, you know, Nancy found a way, and the archival producers and the team to sort of you know, make sure that that wasn't lacking. You know, how do you, you have to, you have to just find, find what you can and, and come into the story where you can and, and try to propel it forward. So. I mean, I think there was a lot of a lot of tenacity, as you just heard. Yes. And just a lot of skill in in thinking about how to how to move the narrative forward and make sure that it's colored in. And and so there's a lot. There's a, that's why the credits are so long, right? <laughs> there's a lot of people yes. that Nancy found yes. to help you know, pull together. I, I mean, you're absolutely right, Christy. That this this that beautiful interweaving of of archival footage with you know still pictures that we found, et cetera, is really the masterpiece of Jeffrey Friedman my other year. I mean, he is amazing. And, and Sharon Wood, uh, my, uh, another producer, and, and Rachel Antel, the people that did all the work to find some of that you know, archival footage from places all around the world. So yeah, it really was a work of an incredibly skilled team. You're very art, yes, indeed. Um, Christy, when did you join this project? What was your, in the end, what was your role? I was a friend of the project um, in 2000, what was it, 16 maybe? I, we had lunch, to a mutual friend, uh, associate producer, Andrea Brupont, said, that you want to have lunch with this wonderful new director? And, and I was working on another film at the time, and I said, lunch is great. I was in town, and been in Haiti, and came back. And I just remember, you know, thinking it was so amazing. The only thing I really had to offer was just make sure you make the film that you Want to make because a lot there's a lot of pressure which I didn't oh, ever forget. <laughs> yeah, but then and then um, during um, during when the pandemic sort of locked everything down, I was producing a film actually with Sharon Wood on Ai Weiwei, the the Chinese disney artist called Ai Weiwei Yours Truly, and it was we were in our festival run and you know getting ready for distribution and everything shut down and um, Sharon called me up and and, I, and said you know would you want to join this team because we're we're finishing this film and you know, we need more, more producing help, and um, I was like, yeah, I haven't seen it. Like, can I see it? I, I, I want to be involved. And I remember Nancy well, and, and, and Passant's story is incredible, and then I saw, uh, we weren't, we weren't in the picture lot, it was like the, one, one of the passes, um, I guess it was 2021, I think June maybe I saw it, and I was like, yeah, I, I want to talk to her about this film, and that was super fun because, you know, in the last year of making a film like this, a lot of the fun things happen. You know, uh, you title the film. You get you get to so the composer uh, Todd came in um, with this incredible score. I don't know if people were. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. So you know, there's just a lot of like division of labor that has to happen, and um, we just got excited to. I was really happy to be able to be free, and, and it, you know, Nancy's just an incredible director because having never done this before, she had the patience and the tenacity and the ability to go out and get the people you know when they were available, and, and that was the one silver lining was that, you can even say those words, but that, you know, you were able, people were not going anywhere. And they <laughs> well, I agree with everything that Christy just said. As somebody who's, now I see it twice now, I feel that it's a, just a, an utterly complete and satisfying and rich film. And you explaining 10 years of work to put everything together, that in itself, that process of researching assembling and thinking about it and refining it to get what you wanted um, is really, it's extraordinary. And I know for people who think, you know, documentary filmmaking has a lot of challenges. Um, often the film that you think you set out to make isn't the film that you end up with, and it can often take a long time to get there. Um, 
But I, I guess I would ask you, once you first had a vision for what it would be, did it change a lot from that time? Or you had, your eyes were on the prize the whole time. You kind of knew this was the outcome you wanted to get. You know, actually, it's, it is very much what I originally envisioned. And that, that, I, I, that was a beautiful kind of coming full circle for me when I, when I very first started, uh, you know, a couple of established documentary filmmakers asked me, well, you know, what are your ideas? How would you tell the story? And I, you know, I watched a lot of documentaries. I, did, I took a couple of classes. I mean, I didn't get to go to USC, but I did take some classes at, you know, at, at San Francisco State. And, 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 I, and I was having lunch with a, a local Mill Valley filmmaker, and I said, well, you know, my vision really is to use the format of 11 times of Harvey Milk, which is this beautiful film, uh, you know, that won the Academy Award uh, for Best Documentary look quite a while ago. Uh, but it starts, if you know that film, it starts with that the inciting incident, which is, of course, when Harvey Milk is, is murdered, and, and Diane Feinstein is there at City Hall in San Francisco doing the press conference, and and then it, it kind of goes back, and then you learn who Harvey Milk was, and you learn who, how, what he meant to the community, and then it kind of culminates again with this candlelight vigil down Market Street. And, and, you know, I mean, in the end, I mean, that is kind of what we have here. And ironically, Jeffrey Friedman, my editor, he and Rob Epstein, his partner actually worked, made that film. So it, 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 um, that, that was not envisioned when I started. But yeah, it, remarkably, it did follow that path. Yes, great. That, that's great. And it's the symmetry of the, you know, of the funeral opening and closing is quite good. The bookends are great. I know the audience has questions, so let's go there. Who has hands? Come up. Yes, in the middle, in the right there. Yes, go ahead. Um, I noticed a lot of mourners were men, and I was wondering if she, um, she was kind of a hero to the men there too, um, because of the social change the country was going through, or. What, why that was? Uh, that's interesting. That's an interesting comment. I don't. I, I. I think maybe you noticed that for it for sure in the house where they were doing all of the pujas, all of the ceremonies. In the house, there were a lot of men because women were supposed to be outside. There, there's. I mean, women's place. Where, you know was was not in the room where the male Buddhist monks were doing those those that prayer ceremony. Um, but I would say that that clearly she she moved not just women, but she moved men as well. I mean what she did moved men as well. Yeah she was she was it's a great question too because it hits on a theme that that I really love about this film, which is um, you know <laughs> that the government of this country wasn't really in touch with and that's not that's not only in that country, but um, that she was a she was a hero a heroine to to people of her country who were following her climb, who did really care about her succeeding, and um, and I think her her death really shocked shocked the nation and it brought all kinds of people out to to express their grief, um, including men. And I'm, I'm glad that you, you noticed that because it's something we had actually never we actually not talked about that. But. But it's really, she was sort of a, a woman of the people. It wasn't her intention, per se. She became somebody who fought for her country. And you can see her sort of awakening as a, as a feminist and, a, and sort of a freedom fighter for, for the Sherman people who, who, as you see in the film, were, were not, um, were, who were looked down upon by, by many people, many, many in, in our country. So she had a, her death really did, her life was very inspiring, obviously, but, and her death really did have sort of an, a big unifying effect that, that I think that was part of what you saw on the street, the, the shock and the grief um, in, en masse. Just to add to that, because I, I don't know, sometimes everything goes by so quickly, but if you remember Pasan Yanji, uh, the anthropologist, the, the Sherpa anthropologist, saying something in that big press conference where Pasan, where she said, you know, she was taught, representing herself not just as a Sherpa woman, as a Nepali woman, and that must have made some people's heads spin. Well, it, what what is really behind that statement is the fact that in Nepal at that time, you know, it was a, it was a Hindu kingdom, or you know, it was it was ninety percent of Nepal is Hindu, ten percent are Buddhist, and and the caste system very very prevalent 
in Nepal. And as a Buddhist, they you know, kept talking about her as being you know, backward from the hills, but as a Buddhist, as an indigenous woman, she wasn't just low caste, she was outside of the caste system with virtually no rights. So the term outcast, that's what it comes from. And, and so you know, for all of these people, these prominent people to be paying attention to this woman who was below, like the untouchable, I mean, it, it, was, it was really astounding. Who else has a question? Yes, go ahead, right here. Uh, did the earthquake um, in, it was 2015, really hammer your ability to get footage and contact people to travel? Uh, you know, it, 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 it didn't hamper my, my shoots per se. I mean, I, I you know, worked around that. But, but what it did is it, the National Archives, so, so Nepali TV, um, there's not a great National Archive of, of anything in Nepal, but everything that did exist was destroyed in the earthquake. So if I didn't have it before that, we actually, you know, then it was gone. Well, so let's work some of the sides. Go ahead, Ben. Um, this is more a question about the, one of the challenges of making a documentary film where you have to interview people and get their input or, or their recordings for the film. And then when you put it into the film, it might not keep them in the best light. So I'm thinking of Mark Retard actually as he's offering his uh, commentary and it comes out looking uh, not like roses. And so what's the reaction to that? And how is that a challenge as a filmmaker when you're trying to get these sources to divulge information that you, you want for the film? That is a really great question because, you know, I'm going to France in November to a, a film festival. <laughs> and and I, I'm, I haven't spoken with Mark since yes, the film yes, stuff. Yes, he has not seen the film. So, um, you know, it, it is very tricky because, you know, Mark, I mean, Mark poured his heart out to me. I mean, you know, he really did. He um, has, he's such an interesting man. He actually wants to climb Everest again. He's 70. And, and uh, um, you know, I had to, it's a, it's a hard thing. I mean, he, I think that, I think though, I mean, my, my perception of those interviews is that, you know, Mark does make a very good point. You know, he did not sign up to have Pasangla and Sherpa come up and, and be part of, of uh, his client's expedition, and I think, I think that he's justified in that frustration, and, and I don't think that, that Nancy set out to kind of like, gotcha, and I'm gonna put that in the film, and so hopefully, um, you know, both that, that did come out. I mean, it's, it is complicated, and, it, and um, in retrospect, um, you know, it's, you, you, can, you can sympathize, I, I could sympathize with him, um, too. And Mark, Mark has actually written, written a book, it, it's in, Fran in French, I mean, so I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, but he, he talks about his experience as a child being abused by his father. Um, he's a gay man, and, uh, and, and he, now, he wasn't out then, and he talks about how so all of his rage uh, about his upbringing, he felt like that really fueled his desire to climb and do these outrageous things. And, and, and so, I mean, he's got, there's just a whole lot there with Mark, and I feel like we have a really, we do have a good relationship, and I, I, I hope that he's able to come when we screen it in, in the His framing the quote is pretty amazing. In the, front, in the beginning when he does say, um, too, too much ambition can be kept mm -hmm. um, You know, I think that that's true. You know, I mean, it can, it can be, it can be, um, you know, I, I think the film is actually asking the question in a lot of ways, who, who gets to take risks? You know, and that's one reason why I was attracted to the project too, is that, you know, when you look at men, um, typically, you know, white Western European men who have done things such as scale Everest or have done other incredible feats, uh, either losing their lives or not coming close, typically it's like, what a courageous person, like how heroic, you know, and, and with Pasan Lama Sherpa, how could she do that to her children? How could she, you know, who gets to take risks? And, and, I, and I, think, um, I think the presence of Mark and the other, other European mountaineers in the film really helps strengthen that contrast, and I really love it there. Let's take one more question, because I know there's a big event coming for, uh, yeah, let's go ahead, your hands up here, your left hand. Right there, yeah. I'm just curious, who took the photographs of the sun on the sun of Everest? There is no photograph of Busan on Everest, because they lost the camera. Yeah, she's on the top of the wall. Oh, okay. didn't happen. 